kid. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Uh, today it's a very special day, Memorial Day weekend. We are um, restarting Little Buddhist program. So I'm really glad that uh, Heather's taken responsibility and we have some little Buddhists, um, little Buddhists on their way to become chanting leaders, you know, that's great. So <laughs> delighted, but totally. Um, you know, my goal for um, Lions Road Dharma Center is to uh, give all of the teachings um, to uh, people in all the different uh, uh, roles in their life for yogis, uh, for monks, for nuns, for um, uh, householders. So <clears throat> I think we're doing it. Um, I'm particularly glad when we have children and um, I want the B Buddha and the littles to get to know each other. Don't you? Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm happy to say that we have people here um, practicing beginning meditation um, Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights and Thursday nights and Saturday mornings and Sunday at 10. And we have people doing um, book study groups um, or have maybe another one will come up. We have people um, taking uh, you know, vows to uh, uh, be kind and be kind to themselves. We have a uh, recovery group. We have Tai Chi and martial arts. And um, we have people doing uh, highest yoga tantra practice too. So uh, we've brought qualified teachers in and we have uh, people actually reading the classical texts um, that are uh, been read in India and Tibet for centuries. And finally, we have our Friday night um, production shared with the Middle East Health Foundation called Expressions. So um, based on that idea, I'm giving a talk tonight on uh, this morning on uh, uh, spontaneous presence, right? That's the title of the talk, right, Penny? <laughs> okay. <laughs> like that. <clears throat> Um, the style of, of teaching generally um, here, even a little public setting, um, I have a little bit of edge, so I, I'll say it <laughs> like, if people aren't doing any kind of practice at all, maybe my talks won't make any sense. Um, there's plenty of um, books and um, YouTubes and teachers, you know, they're always going to try to get it and you can go away and say, okay, understand completely. Uh, this feels comfortable and um, I agree with everything the teacher said, which is fine. Um, but as, uh, you know, Kansa Rimshe said when he was here a couple of months ago, if you have a vision of a uh, let's say Manjushri, the Buddha in the form of a youth with a sword and Manjushri shows up and um, you agree with everything Manjushri said, it's probably a delusion, right? <laughs> you know, it's not a teaching, it's just your projection, right? <clears throat> so today I hope to say a few things that are familiar, but also some things that are new because the midway is a balance of challenge and support. Hopefully like 51% support and 49% challenge. I was a little, but we can't stay on the diving board forever. <clears throat> Spontaneous presence, um, it's um, basically uh, somewhat of a translation of the Dzogchen term uh, togal, uh, which sometimes literally means crossing over or crossing the peak or something like that. <clears throat> uh, so Chen's um, generally uh, uh, has two main facets, uh, Tertu cutting through um, where people need to see um, uh, the true nature of mind, uh, non-dualistic mind, uh, Rigpa, as opposed to what they say in Tibetan, like, 
SEM, which was just like ordinary mind. So it's essential that um, when we're practicing at that level to recognize the difference between um, our ordinary mind, which is um, limited and fixated on subject and object, and the um, Rigpa, which is um, clarifying subject and object. Notice it's a clarifying subject and object. Uh, so it's very popular these days um, where people say, I I'm doing non-dual practice. Have you heard that? Like, I do non-dual practice. I say, well, that's great, but how'd you get here today? Driving the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the road? You didn't, you, hopefully you took a road here. Uh, hopefully you didn't drive down the middle of the road. <clears throat> so sometimes, of course, um, in Buddhist Tantra and Dzogchen, we say non-dual, but um, it's not the non-dual of oneness that um, is in the um, Vedic yoga uh, tradition. It's um, something different that the Buddha um, came up with, and he called his experience and his reality that he said was the truth. He called it interdependent origination. He didn't call it oneness or twoness. He called it interdependent origination, that things arise uh, together and they disappear together, and then they rise again. <clears throat> so, uh, our show particularly is um, looking very closely at how uh, things disappear, particularly uh, our ignorance and how um, uh, then uh, the wisdom mind uh, appears. Uh, Tokal is very much interested in, and then uh, how do we uh, present that? <clears throat> so, uh, some people say that the togal, the spontaneous presence, is absolutely necessary. We can't just have um, a wisdom mind. We also uh, have to be able to see how um, wisdom and phenomena and presentation work together. <clears throat> so that's why um, I thought for this sangha here, if you really want to do um, Dzogchen and Tantra practice, um, you need to understand that life is a performance. It's a show up, show me world. <clears throat> the, the Zen group, <laughs> the Zen teachings have a story um, about the Buddha holding up a flower during one of the teachings. <clears throat> I don't know what kind of flower it was, maybe, maybe it was a tulip like this. So uh, the uh, story is the whole uh, Sangha fell silent. But one, one person didn't. Anybody know that story? Who was it that didn't? Maha Kashapa, yeah. What, what did Maha Kashapa do? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, actually, my um, main Zen teacher, Sasaki Roshi, said, well, that's, that's kind of true, but actually, um, he laughed out loud. There's a difference there. You know, it's very, uh, that's why I studied with uh, Roshi. Um, if we just smiled, no one would, uh, you know, maybe see it. But if you laugh out loud, people are going to hear it. So Roshi explained how everyone um, became uh, in samadhi with the flower and with the Buddha, but uh, Mahakashapa understood that the uh, samadhi state is not the final state. The final state is the expression. So the samadhi has to break and you have to emerge and be born from the samadhi to really understand uh, what true um, interdependence, true enlightenment is, right? Do you think everybody got a little annoyed with my kashyapa? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> In the Zen school, of course, um, 
they say Mahakashapa um, became the first um, uh, inheritor of the Buddhist teachings. Even if that's untrue, it's a good story, right? Um, is, it, is it always necessary to um, laugh, to um, express ourselves? No. Uh, um, any, in a way, if there's awareness, any presentation goes. So one of my teachers said, you know, it's like the computer, if you, you can just kind of press any key. <clears throat> The um, idea of spontaneous presence does include this idea of leap um, as a metaphor, but it really does feel like a leap. So if we're uh, on the diving board at some point, uh, you could bounce, but then you have to take the dive, right? At that point, that's spontaneous presence. There's no going back. Is that right? Can you back up your dive? I don't think so. <laughs> so in life, I'm sure there's a bunch of us that wishes they could back up some of their dives. I know I could. <laughs> like, I'd like to undive that relationship or that, or that business or something. <laughs> like that. So uh, uh, when when we say spontaneous presence, um, there's there's that sense of total 100% commitment like that. So um, when I've practiced um, with all my teachers, uh, whether it had been Vajrayana or Zen or even Theravada, um, the uh, direction is just say, just do something. Because usually we're kind of stuck like, okay, I want to say the right thing. What, what, would, what would the enlightened thing, you know, be? How, how do I, you know, like that, and then and then we're stuck, aren't we? <clears throat> I'm fond of saying how in couple therapy, um, you know, when uh, usually it's the wife. Sometimes not always, but it says, uh, uh, you know, I I don't think you love me, and then the guy goes, you know, I do. Is that spontaneous presence? Probably not, right? I know that that could be just being shy, but um, you know, some sometimes you know people really um, they they take the dive. Then you know, they go, "I'm sorry, I've heard you. I I do really love you." You know, and, and they reach over to touch touch someone. Right? That's that's more the idea of spontaneous presence. <clears throat> so it could be true. You could say, "You know, I love you," but um, that's uh, a little bit dead words compared to actually, um, you know, putting yourself on the line, don't you think? Yeah. So with spontaneous presence, um, it's somewhat, um, it's alive, it's total aliveness, but also there's no turning back. Um, you know, the phrase, you can't unring the bell. So, so sometimes in spontaneous presence, um, uh, you know, we don't hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Sometimes you miss it, okay? But you get another chance because things are constantly evolving and they're momentary, right? So you get another chance. But sometimes students think, oh, you know, if I'm practicing on that level where I'm seeing nature of awareness and all I have, and then I have to make the expression like really perfect, you know? I have to do it just right. Um, and we know that that's um, a trap, don't we? So that's another reason why I like the expressions um, that we do on, on last Friday, because uh, everyone that um, performs or displays their art or photography or their dance or their poetry um, has some presence, you know, um, but um, there's also, it, it's also live theater, right? So sometimes um, uh, things happen <clears throat> and not, it's not super rehearsed. So one of my favorite uh, all-time shows was a couple of months ago where one of the poets um, uh, 
uh, decided to read uh, her poetry upside down in a headstand. So, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, the headstand collapsed, and she had a table and with a, a candle, lit candle on it, and glass on all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Eli and Patty jumped up and, okay, let's clean it up. And I thought, well, you know, I was sitting there going, well, that's the end of that presentation, you know, and the gong, and then we'll get the next person in. <laughs> but um, she did the headstand again and finished the poem. <sighs> you know, like, we're not going to have her do the, um, the gymnastics again. But the, isn't that fantastic? You know, so that 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 takes something there. You know, so uh, the mistake and and kind of the correction. You know, is like, you know, what um, uh, that's what teachers live for, right? You know, where where someone's able to work that zone where uh, they um, will make a presentation and then being able to kind of. Uh, hone it and refine it and make it again, you know? It's fantastic like that. <clears throat> so, um, you know, maybe at some point when I'm doing videos with Bill, you know, he'll do outtakes or something. <laughs> <laughs> don't you have outtakes? I think that's the funniest part, you know? I don't know. I like reality TVs, but are they really reality? They're not, are they? They aren't, are they? So rehearsed, rehearsed mistakes, something like that. <clears throat> it's it's impossible to plan spontaneous presence. You we can do sitting meditations, lots of technique, um, but we have to set up, put ourselves in a situation that um, we're willing to express ourselves and uh, you know willing to be uh, uh, seen like that. So. Um, uh, it, it takes a lot of courage, right? Usually we want to kind of hide out, go in a cave, get enlightened, and then show up at our high school reunion and everybody thinks we look great, right? <laughs> Here at Lions are we, we don't have, um, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't generally live together, you know, so it's, uh, in a way, that's good and bad, you know, when people are in a retreat center or monastery together, there's uh, so many opportunities for a spontaneous presence. Uh, you you can't just hide out. Um, but uh, over lines where we get together a lot and I'm fairly active. So as some of my close students know, um, I'm, I'm trying to work uh, spontaneous presence, right? And spontaneous presence I means the, the teacher is like working both the side of appearing and disappearing. So when we say spontaneous presence, don't think that it's just appearing. So uh, we're quite present um, in our absence too, right? So, you know, um, uh, earlier Patty pointed out that Chris Charles, um, you know, our friend and restaurant owner and donator to um, expressions passed away in a car wreck. And that's that's a spontaneous thing, right? That's an absence. <clears throat> when we look at it with a wisdom mind, however, is that um, uh, the spontaneous presence uh, is the complete middle way of appearing and disappearing. This is important. So uh, uh, we don't have a bias towards like uh, always, always saying something sometimes a uh, silence. So the Buddha was known for sometimes not saying anything, right? So uh, when we say uh, this spontaneous silence also and, and disappearing. So appearing and disappearing, appearing again and disappearing, the cycle of birth and death uh, and understanding that and manifesting that completely is um, of course the uh, activity of emptiness, to put it in a Mahayana way, or to put it in a Dzogchen way, spontaneous presence, and incorporates both arising and passing away, appearing and disappearing. Some of us are biased to disappearing, and some of us are biased to appearing, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so <clears throat> we train to having like uh, a balance of those two features um, because we know that actually um, when when it comes down to it, uh, it's like rolling dice. Um, it's in the case that if you keep on rolling dice, you know, it'll go 50-50, right? Yeah, we'll see. Or infinity, I don't know, like that. The um, uh, the teachings that I've given on retreat are very important for those people that have shown up um, for longer retreats. Um, so I just briefly want to mention um, Garb Dorji's uh, three points. Garb Dorji is um, uh, uh, one of the founding teachers in, in the Dzogchen or completion teachings. So the first uh, uh, vital point is introducing the directly the uh, face of Rigpa itself. <clears throat> so usually um, we need a teacher to do that, some kind of interaction that pulls us out of um, our fixed um, self and uh, opens us up to um, uh, our open awareness, right? But, you know, sometimes um, people, the events in people's lives that uh, the, the environment is the teacher or animals are the teacher where we have, uh, you know, a spontaneous opening and, and see uh, the world beyond our limitations usual. But um, that can be tricky because sometimes even though we have openings, uh, the clouds of karma <laughs> come back, right? So we need a second vital point, which is decide upon one thing and one thing only. And uh, lots of times we really need a teacher. We didn't need a teacher for the first one to open us up. We, we really need a teacher for the, for the second one to say, you know, just, just to know I can't be anything other than this. That kind of, you know, that kind of decision. So um, there's a turning point in our bodhisattva practice, um, which is called eighth level, uh, the immovable or achala. We have an achala statue, um, a Japanese style in the dojo, fudomyo unmovable, deciding on one thing and one thing only. It's not like deciding like, I really like vanilla ice cream and that's it. It's deciding, it's knowing it can't, like when you look and see the actual nature of things, the reality, it can't be any other way. It can't be any other way. This is important because, um, and, uh, higher level teachings, particularly in California, some people think, well, it, uh, the reality is beyond conceptual thought, right? Can't encompass in words. We've, we've heard that in, in the scriptures, right? Is that correct? Can't, can't be captured that way. However, just because our real experience, our real lived experience, our wake experience is not capturable by um, the limitations doesn't mean that it's illogical. This is important for people that actually are students of Dharma and not New Age. So um, the uh, the logic is still in place. You can't be in the same place. Uh, you can't have two things the same place at the same time. You can't have, you can't have something that exists and doesn't exist at the same time. And people get all weird when I say that and go, "Well, if you're it's un, non-conceptual, then you get to have your cake and eat it too. You get to have, you know, it exists and doesn't exist, or neither exists or doesn't exist, or you know, all the tetralemma from Nagarjuna, but you don't." There's a big disappointment when teachers point out that you don't get your cake and eat it too. 
actually not logic, which is like it is a it you know it's that it can't be both isn't isn't right. Is that disappointing? Probably. <laughs> like you know. So uh, it it need not be. It's very clear, but um, that's deciding on the one point. You see, it can't be any other way. So uh, next retreat we'll go into that more. But then there's no wavering. You see. You can see nature of awareness, nature of mind, whatever you want to say. But then, then people are thinking, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can have everything. I can have it like it's not it, and I have it at the same time. Maybe that's emptiness. Maybe no, it's not. That's called California or something. I don't know what. <laughs> California. It's like we can have all the cars we want without the pollution, or like you know, it's California. Just joking. Third one is confidence directly in the liberation of rising thoughts. So um, even though you know we've seen we've had an interesting breakthrough and we go this is it you know or the confidence um, one thing only um, things arise again and um, tip us over. And it's interesting, isn't it? People, you know, everyone here has done their share of practice and training with spiritual teachers and therapists and breakthroughs and, you know, and um, then we get hooked again, don't we? So it takes uh, a little, definitely like a teacher or feedback for the third to develop the real, like, even when things um, appear, uh, uh, we're, not, um, we're not fooled, basically. Because thoughts and phenomena um, can still uh, appear, uh, you know, solid, like real, like you believe them. So, what's the definition? If you believe everything you think, what's the um, what's the psychiatric definition of that? Psychosis, right? Believe everything you think. So um, this isn't not this isn't unbelieving everything we think. We just know that the thoughts are not solid. Is that they um, they they don't have to be believed or disbelieved. We can um, we can directly see that um, the thoughts are operating freely, and um, we have the power of choice. It's not like all the thoughts go away and, and we just dwell in a thoughtless state. That's why we did drugs, right? So where they're liberated, meaning we are we are free to have the thought and embellish it or pursue it or act on it or whatever. We're free. Isn't that nice? So um, there's sometimes a debate and um, and Buddhists like to debate a lot, discuss, which is good. Like um uh you know, in Rigpa, are there are there thoughts or not? Does well, or you know, does the does the Buddha have does the Buddha have thoughts? What do you think? Sure, I have to. You know. <clears throat> And Rigpa, are there are there any thoughts? Some teachers say yes, some teachers say no. You know, it's funny. <clears throat> but in any case, um, the spontaneous presence um, uh, teachings is something that's uh, given in a, a retreat setting or a steady um, practice setting. But finally, um, it actually has to be in spontaneous interactions. You can't say, you can't just get up and say, now I'm gonna be spontaneously present today. I mean, that's kind of nice. You could say that, I'm gonna to try to be open and stuff like that, but you have to be put in or willing to put yourself in situations where you're caught in the act of being yourself. 
I try to catch people here. Many people get away from me, but a few people I've caught, which is nice. I like catching people. And then there's, it's very humorous and liberating, um, even when it's a little painful, right? <clears throat> the, um, just to be a little scholarly, the, there's definite practices in the spontaneous present teachings, um, uh, you know, interior practices that um, involve uh, Salong Tigle, who it's called, or the Tulko practices. The uh, uh, Salong practices I've introduced a little bit here, but um, actually, if you're not doing that much practice, they don't make any sense. So um, I'm not doing that presently, just on retreat. Um, but in the Toga things, there's particularly emphasis on um, spheres and um, visionary experiences, and on the uh, inner channels and uh, the winds, the prana and the energy centers, you know. So people are interested in that kind of thing, don't you think? But um, if we're doing those kind of inner yoga practices from a kind of pedantic style, like I just want to, I don't want to be caught um, being spontaneous, meaning being um, a little vulnerable, then it doesn't make any sense to do the practices. So if you're doing the practices, like, you think, okay, I'm meditating on the winds and the channels and the chakras, and um, I'm trying to hide out, you know, or I'm not trusting the situation, then we're just solidifying uh, the practice. So that's why it's hard. The practices themselves are not hard. The yogic practices themselves are not hard, actually. The concentrations and even visionary experiences are not hard. The hard part is developing the ability to be, um, you know, open and vulnerable and, and uh, compassionate at the same time. That's hard. That's hard being kind of caught in the act of being yourself, even, um, you know, when, uh, when it, it's good, right? Sometimes we're so touched and so vulnerable, we're crying because we're happy, and then it can be kind of embarrassing sometimes, don't you think? But when we're all together, and then when we're crying because we're happy, then uh, then something very special is generated, and uh, the Dzogchen mandala becomes into, into being. So we've seen that a number of times here over the years, whether it's a ceremony, or little Buddhas, or um, just having a meal together, or uh, in expressions, where something that uh, is not a separate thing, but is made up of everyone's spontaneous presence is uh, manifested. And then it's quite interesting that I like that. It creates a mandalic situation <laughs> like that. So uh, the whole situation is spontaneously present. It's not just like individuals are like that. So long talk. So maybe um, we're recording it. And then um, like, uh, Doug is doing transcriptions of talks, and then he'll transcribe it, and then I'll go, oh, gosh, did I say that? Why did I say that? Um, but I'm trying to do it mostly un unedited um, uh, so that uh, it is spontaneously present. So uh, I do actually prepare my talks in the sense, in a general sense. Um, but uh, I try not to do it scripted, so I'm, I'm available to say something. Uh, you can't say something intelligent if you're not also willing to say something stupid, you see? So if we're always trying to say, I always want to say something intelligent, be perfect, you know, be on tune, then um, we're, we're, we're doing ordinary mind. So uh, we have a few minutes if people want to make some comments or questions or complaints. <laughs> I'm open to that. But do we have a mic? Yeah, we have one mic. One mic walked out, but spontaneously walked out. <laughs> oh, gosh.
Uh, Lala? Yeah. So we talked a lot about Dzogchen. Yep. Um, but not a lot about Mahamudra. And I know that they're very close and very similar. But why is Dzogchen? Why do you focus more on Dzogchen and not Mahamudra? <clears throat> um, maybe I like saying Dzogchen. <laughs> Maybe aesthetic reasons like that. So, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, I think there are slightly different ways of um, uh, pointing out, and you know, but but of course, getting at the same thing like that. So, uh, you know. Maybe next time, you know, I'll just say, you know, Mahamudra. However, you know, I wanted to talk about um, uh, Garb Dorje and the, you know, the three vital points um, like that. But of course, there's, um, you know, like six points of Tilopa and things like that. So we can go into that too. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, the case that the great uh, teachers of the 20, 21st century are, um, uh, you know, for these teaching traditions um, came down through teachers. So some use some kind of language and some use other kind of language and techniques, but they still get to the same point, you know, like that. Um, yeah. Good question. <laughs> See, I have the mic, so I might as well. I don't know if it's working. Ask a question. It's not. It should be. It's green. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think probably most of us in this room want to be very conscious of how we behave and what we say and what we do. Um, maybe some of it comes from shyness, but a lot of it is motivated by, you know, just mm, wanting to reflect the center well and all that good stuff. So how yeah. do you balance that, you know, that intention with spontaneous presence? The um, motivation to be um, a benefit to others and to feel alive ourselves, bodhicitta, and to be awake and alive to benefit others um, uh, is itself spontaneous presence. Good answer. <laughs> I like that. That's good. The thing is, when you know, sometimes when you're talking about bodhicitta, that um, uh, strong um, wish to help others, and at the same time knowing that it's best if we get some training and sanity ourselves and be awake. Um, uh, ends up in the moral universe. Okay. Um, so that, that becomes a problem. So I like to sometimes translate, you know, bodhicitta's life force, something like that. Um, you know, the, the, the life force that, that wants to wake up and be creative, like that. Um, so one one way of uh, you know uh, thinking about Mahamudra and Dzogchen is that you know it's it's the final um, uh, teaching on how to be creative because uh, uh, the reality doesn't want to remain static or inert; it's always expressing itself. But um, the when we're just talking about kind of the cognitive side or the expressive side, we tend, you know, it, it has to, it, it is the uh, the kind of realization side of bodhicitta. So <clears throat> um, the, the motivational side um, is, is the juice and without it, um, the, the you know the the so-called higher teachings don't don't work. 
Oh, uh, I like telling the story, which I'll tell again because I like it. So when I was attending a as a uh, spectator, the a, a session with Itzhak Perlman master class in Aspen one year. That was like first violinist in New York Symphony or something, and playing, you know, maybe Dvorak or whatever. And it's like Perlman said, um, yeah, but can you play it a little sweeter? And he played it again, and it was different. But if if, <laughs> if the violinists hadn't done all the practice, it, that would have meant nothing. So we have to train to be natural. It's it's you have it's reality is there and what you bring to it. So it's the middle way. It has to be where we're we're refining our uh, abilities. So we can't just say, well, I'll just do what I want to do, and that's liberation. It isn't. That's what we're doing already. <laughs> so. What what else is addiction? But I want what I want when I want it, right? So, so we train, and then we actually manifest the natural state. But uh, the bodhicitta is the most powerful because um, without that, uh, you know, motivation, uh, you know, we're just kind of collecting um, ideas. So uh, that's why, particularly in this tradition. Um, tantric tradition, um, you know, we're trying to supercharge things, which isn't it doesn't work for everybody, for sure. You know, we're we're introducing you know bliss states and energy states and and you know kind of you know weird situations and artistic stuff and power and for some people that doesn't work, obviously. But for some people, it does so, and you're here. There you go. <laughs> Look at that, Lisa, and then Dylan. Oh, in the chat. Okay, we do Lisa, and then the chat. Hi. 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 I'm being spontaneously present okay. yes. with this Hi. question. Um, I'm new to a lot of the Buddhist thought, so I, I like to put things in my mind in my own layman terms to make sure that I understand it. So would you say that spontaneous presence is like an intuitive reaction that becomes sort of a commitment towards something? You can tear that up. I just want to make sure that I or see if I'm grasping the concept. Um, yeah, a response. Yeah. So intuitive in the sense that you know we're we're pulling everything together and taking a little bit of a leap and and making a response. The thing is that um, it isn't just a response to the situation. We understand that actually the fundamental situation is just that. Reality is just that. The spontaneous presence. It isn't like well the reality's there and then. I make a spontaneous present, <laughs> you know, but in the training part, it feels like that. It feels like reality is a little static, and then we train to be kind of spontaneously present or creative. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I like the word creative because then you you have kind of raw material and you have to you have to work with it. It's not coming just out of nothing. So it's what you bring to it, and it's what's there. Yeah, good question. So the chat, the chat person somewhere. Okay. Okay. It says, how do you deal with intrusive, destructive thoughts that go against compassionate activity? Letting them remain definitely seems like it affects the field, even without acting while trying to remove them, agitates the mind. What can you do? And following that, it says, the harder I try to generate compassion, the stronger the afflictions. So if you leave them as there is, it's hard. If you um, try to change them, it's hard too. Something like that. 
yeah <clears throat> and then it's hard to um generate bodhicitta or something generate compassion and yeah. as the compassion is generated the afflictions also yeah. arise so when we take on yoga practice there's um a piece that lots of times we miss in America, which is you need a lot of support. Because any any insight-oriented practice, yogic practice that combines insight and energy is going to stir things up. So, uh, you know, traditional uh, teachings are kind of boring in the sense <laughs> from American California style because they're talking a lot about accumulating merit or things like that. It basically means you're you're strengthening your support system. You're, you're developing a lot of positive qualities, but uh, you're doing it because you're around super nice people and you're around in safe situations and you've got, you know, enough, uh, you know, you've got food and shelter and services like that. So, it's extremely, you know, it's a very difficult to try to do yogic practices or insight-oriented practices when we're struggling financially and um, mental health-wise too, because all the yogic practices are a bit challenging. So if if it all seems kind of like overwhelming, then we have to really make sure like we we put ourselves in definitely a healing environment. So there, there are healing practices, but um, you know we don't have time to go into it now. But um, if you're trying to challenge your thoughts or develop kindness for others, and you're exhausted, then you you need you need to be in a very supportive environment, and um, that that can be that can be rough. We can't always get to supportive environments, but um, uh, generally. Uh, we need more support than challenge, you see. People in the West are kind of college educated and kind of arrogant for the most part. And um, as I am, so, uh, you know, we think we can just kind of dive in, but um, we, we need a lot of friends and we need, you know, uh, uh, you know, a lot of safety net because anytime we start challenging our delusions or our anger, it fights back. Right, and if you st start doing the mindfulness meditation correctly, um, guess what happens? It gets better for a little while, <laughs> okay? Because you're you're kind of calming the surface. But if you go further, you're digging things up. So mindfulness level one is like you're, you know, kind of mowing the lawn and you're kind of mowing the weeds. But if you really want it, uh, if you start digging, then yes, you're going to bring up. Uh, a lot of stuff, and that's when we need a lot of support. Yeah, I don't know. If, I hope that's helpful. Excellent. Yeah, la la la. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the little final thing is. Um, it's uh, it's the case that we can't help but um, be mindful and be expressive. We can't help but be creative. We're always doing something. It's not like we can't go back to zero and say, "Okay, I just want to get reborn, clean slate." You know, we're we're in the midst of it. And actually, you know, we're using our intelligence and our creativity, our spontaneous presence all the time. So it's not the case that we're completely stupid or anything. We just are. We're, you know, we've gotten some wrong directions and, you know, we're, we're driving sometimes the wrong way, but um, most of the time we're using our intelligence and we're being present and we're being creative and spontaneous. It's just, we're, as we wake up, we notice that um, it, it's, it's more painful to be asleep and clueless. So the, actually the more practice you do, we become more sensitive so people also in the West think like, I'll do more practice and then things don't bother me anymore.
<laughs> so actually things bother you more, but as like recovery, you're trading one set of problems for a better set of problems. You're more sensitive to the world, but you also have more support. You have a bigger, uh, you know, you don't have a teacup, you have a big bowl, or you just don't have a bowl, you have a swimming pool or a lake or an ocean. So yeah, things still bother you, but it's it's happening in a, in a different kind of space. But the, most most of the time, people are thinking, oh, I'll, I'll get nirvana, and then I won't be bothered anymore by the idiots. You will still be bothered by the idiots. Why wouldn't we be bothered by idiots? Of course we're bothered by idiots. Aren't you? Aren't you? Isn't everyone still bothered by, you know, people do idiotic things on the planet. We're not, you know, Buddhists aren't going to go around like, hey, that's okay, right? Sometimes I have debate with kind of new age Taoist people. And, like, you know, just the workings of, you know, well, nothing's really ever good or bad. You know, it's all blah, blah. And I go, wait a minute, let's talk about child abuse. Is that ever good? No, that's never good. Is that ever good? Never good, right? There's no reason that's good. So that's another thing when we say un uncompounded awareness, spontaneous presence, non conceptual, people think, oh, well, you know, harmful activity is good or bad, just thrown out the window. And sorry, logic isn't thrown out either. You get enlightened and be a Buddha. And if you're driving on the wrong side of the road, you're going to get a head on. And you will get a head on in India if you don't honk when you're going around the curve. It doesn't matter like who you are, right? So still, you know, it's it's um, the case that there's um, the skillful and unskillful, good and bad things to do, right? That makes sense. It's easy. Makes sense. Wear kindness. Should we should we stop here? Taking up more, enough of your time. <laughs> okay. We do closing prayers. Yes, uh, dedication. Due to the merits of these, these virtuous these actions, actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without, without exception, exception into, into that enlightened state. state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which yes, has arisen not, not diminish but, but increase more and more. And more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful of Chinris and Tenzin Kyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, master of Thank you, Autumn. Fantastic. Um, quick announcements. Okay. Uh, so next Saturday, Sunday is Sagadawa, June 4. Um, and there's a lot of things going on, uh, starting at 5 a.m., which will be very fun. Um, Kenshin Rupesha will be giving eight precepts for the day, so the eight Mahayana precepts. It's so an all-day practice that goes into the next morning. Um, you come early. It will also be on Zoom, but please come into the temple. It's actually a lot of fun if you come into the temple. You take the precepts, um, and they're sort of uh, heightened precepts. So uh, no killing, no lying, no stealing, no drinking of any intoxicants, no sexual activity, um, no eating at the wrong time. So it's also a little bit of a fast. So you, you have your last meal at noon. You have vegetarian food only. You don't eat until the next morning, uh, so Monday morning. Um, no singing, no dancing, no perfumes, no ornaments, um, no sitting on high seats or high beds. Uh, so it's a, a, a practice where basically you increase your merit and you sort of increase your awareness of what happens, you know, sort of you're a little bit humbling in a way, but it's a great practice. So that's at 5 a.m. Kendra Mbache is going to give those uh, precepts for the day. Uh, it's sort of a practice that he does on Sagadawa as well. 
Um, and we'll have, uh, you know, some snacks, tea, I don't know what else, some sort of breakfast snack as well. And then at 10 a.m., uh, Kenshin Rinpoche is going to do a teaching on uh, bodhicitta and do bodhisattva vows. Um, so that's 10 a.m. on Sunday, next Sunday. So rather than service being at 11, it'll be at 10 a.m., so it's a little bit earlier. Um, and then also bathing the Buddha will happen as well. And then potluck at noon, so that those who have taken their vows will be able to be able to eat before sun has passed the noon sunrise. And then the rest of the day you can have, if you take the vows, you know, water, juice without pulp, um, but no milk or anything. So um, it'll be a wonderful day for Sagadawa. Um, and am I forgetting something? I'm supposed to say something else, Loma, and I forget. Okay, all right. But I hope you come because Kenshin will say it'll be fun. So the, yeah, we do these activities. Um, the religious side, you know, uh, of Buddhism uh, means that uh, you're objectifying the Buddha. You know, you're thinking, okay, I'm celebrating the life of the Buddha who lived, you know, 2,600 years ago or something. So religious practices are generally objectifying, you know, like we're bathing the baby Buddha, you know, so we're seeing it as the activity of emptiness or um, the nature of awareness is happening kind of out there. Um, the nice thing about the objectification process is you get to do things as a group, right? But um, the realization side is that, um, you know, of course, uh, the Buddha is the same age as we are, right? Can't be any other age, okay? So you have a lineage teacher here before you, so I like to do both. I like the religious side, which is necessarily the side of group activity and objectification, but also if we're doing from the realization level, we realize that, um, you know, we're, we're taking precepts uh, as, as Buddhas ourselves, right? Uh, the point of the precepts is, in this case, is so um, we have more time to uh, devote in compassionate activities like that. So there's absolutely no merit if we think, I'm just doing this so I can be pure or something. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think, okay, um, I'm doing some fasting practice, uh, then uh, go out and, and do some mitzvahs, right? You know, so then, then it makes sense. So we're doing the ritual activities help. The, uh, the objective religious side is only useful if it supports the inner realization, don't you think? Has to, or otherwise we're just, we're doing, <laughs> we're spending a lot of money for the temple and all this stuff, aren't we, Susan, without realization, so why do it? So I like, do Jesus that all the time, it's like, why are you coming here? You know, why are you spending all this money, you know? Why do you drive down here, you know? It's like, if you're not doing realization practice, then why do it? So, but we can do both, you know, we, we, we're showing up and we're doing uh, artistic things together, like bathing the baby Buddha in flowers, but um, we, we must think that actually um, the Buddhas can't be outside of our own functioning, right? Can't be. There can't be the Buddha as an object. But uh, to do things together and to express ourselves, you know, we, we create objects, right? So. So, of course, the real medicine Buddha, you can't see as an object, right? None of the deities here, when you actually meet Vajrasattva or Chenrezig, uh, in their essence, they don't look like this. What do they look like? I'll leave you with that. So, thank you so much for today. I think we have some snacks. Susan's waving. Oh, good. Okay. One more, one more. Um, final announcement. Well, it's not really an announcement. Um, hi, my name is Susan, and um, this is just to kind of welcome anybody who is new, been here for the first time, maybe just a few times, maybe you've come several times and you still feel like you're new. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you know that you are welcome 
and to invite you um, to come in the back and chat, get to know people. We would like to get to know you. And to that end, we have this, this is kind of a long involved sign-in sheet. So it's not necessary to do it all, but if you feel comfortable and would not be um, bothered if somebody contacted you, if you could give us your name and email address, and um, we would just like to call or write and find out, get comments, find out um, what your experience was, and maybe you've got questions about, I don't know, some program or another that you're interested in and you want someone to talk to. So um, if you are comfortable, if you could, this is in the foyer, and there is also um, a similar list in the library that's on the way back to the, the dojo where the snacks and coffee and tea are. Um, if you would just your name and either a phone number or email address so we can follow up a little bit, um, that would be really much appreciated. And... We've got a couple of folks, um, Eli Cruz and Jules, who just graduated, Eli from Sac State, and will be going on to um, grad school in the fall. And Jules, who just graduated from McGeorge like yesterday, um, and is now studying for the bar. So she's got that to take this summer. Anyway, we're going to have kind of a celebration for them um, on the 18th, which is Sunday. And there are some cards in the back, or the cards are there. I'll lay them out in a minute. Um, so if you want to sign and give them your support and congratulations, and um, those will be in the back. And folks on Zoom, if you would like to, and you're not able to make it into the temple like Marie, because <laughs> she lives in Oklahoma, um, if you would like to express um, something to Jules or to Eli, email me. And um, I'll put it on the cards for you and sign your name. I'll pretend I'm you for a while. So Jack, if you know anybody who's on Zoom and would like to just go ahead and send me an email and I'll do that. So that's it. Hey, thanks. Oh my hung. Very good. Oh my.